All right, good morning. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. Atheists, agnostics, skeptics, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here at Seattle Atheist Church. We call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. So instead of going over our creed, uh, which if you're interested, you can find at seattleatheist.church, um, I just want to uh, quickly give a reminder to anyone who is new how we do it here. So the members themselves give the talks and it can be on anything that they want it to be on. Um, to a certain extent, what we consider is that church takes place in the discussion circle because this is a time when we try to make sure we understand each other's arguments, check in with ourselves about what we ourselves believe and why, and we engage in critical thinking. And we want to give people space to be able to have their opinion and change their opinion because it's this process of critical thinking that we think is extremely important. Yeah, so today um, we have um, a, a, a talk, um, so please come on up, introduce yourself, say whatever you'd like to say about yourself. Hi everybody, I'm Josh. Most of you remember me because I'm here every week. Um, today's issue that I've decided to talk about is gun issues, so I'm going to talk about the Second Amendment, talk about sort of the evolution of how guns have changed over time, a little piece on the NRA, and then some stu some study about gun safety and mass shootings. So, let's start off with the Second Amendment of the Constitution, which I'm sure most of you have heard. It's a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of the free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, this language has created a considerable debate um, regarding the amendment's intended scope. A lot of people think that the right to keep and bear arms creates an individual constitutional right that citizens, any citizen of the United States has, and the individual rights theory kind of describes that. The United States Constitution restricts the United States Constitution restricts legislative bodies from prohibiting firearm possession, and that's what a lot of people consider the Second Amendment to do. And amendment, uh, the amendment renders prohibitory, re prohibitory restrictive regulation unconstitutional, which is the big debate, especially now with all of mass shootings being in the news. But it didn't, guns didn't used to be illegal. As a matter of fact, anyone could just buy a gun. And that was for a long time until 1934. In 1934, the government passed the National Firearm Act, which is um, an act that was originally designed to impose a tax on people who were transferring firearms. And it was also supposed to stop businesses from importing firearms and prevent firearms from getting into the hands of criminals. The, uh, the law required the law first required a registration of all firearms with the security for the treasury, but that became unenforceable because so many transactions were happening under the table, especially in the 1930s, that there was no way that they could know if someone had bought a gun. Um, the act was pretty specific to include almost all kinds of guns, but not all kinds of guns. It includes like shotguns and rifles, and but not like marksmanship guns. So it didn't include like super long barrel rifles and things like that, but it included machine guns, silencers, mufflers, all that stuff. So it was enacted by Congress because of their ability to authorize tax, but it had another purpose that was not related to the collection of revenue. And the history of the law basically says that it was designed to prohibit the sale of firearms. Now, um, Congress found that firearms posed a significant crime problem, which in the 1930s, especially around the time of the Great Depression, that would make sense. And um, in the area of things like the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, people thought it was a good idea to prevent people from getting guns. The bill also had a couple other things that are still around today. This is the first time that there was a tax on firearms, and there was a $200 um, tax on all transfers of firearms. It's still true to this day, it's still $200, it hasn't been adjusted for inflation. So $200 in 1934 was a lot of money, and $200 today is, anyone can get 200 bucks. Um, 
but that was the first reg re uh, regulation of firearms. But over time, the course of guns changed, and the military realized there was different applications for guns, and then Ger uh, in Germany, in the Second World War, invented the first assault rifle. So I'm sure you all have heard lots about assault rifles in the news, but the Ger Germans were the first ones to pioneer an assault rifle, and it was because they did a lot of research and they found out that most rifles are designed for long-range combat, but most combat in actual war, especially in World War II, happened within 400 feet of people. So because all the combat was happening within 400 feet, contemporary rifles were really overpowered, and they weren't very efficient at fighting at such close range. The result by the Germans was they made a gun called the Schirmgur 44. I can't pronounce German words, I'm sorry. Um, but it was a, the first gun that was inexpensive, easy to make, could just be stamped out, and held 30 rounds, and was launched in huge numbers. So they made over half a million of them for the Second World War, which is, before the Second World War, it was completely unfathomable that anyone would make half a million guns for anything, let alone half a million of the same. But it was really, really popular, and the Germans er, start, uh, started doing really well. The Soviets, in the Second World War, were not doing as well, and they, did a, they launched a huge research project influenced by by it, and they ended up designing uh, something really famous, which was in 1943, they released the AK-47, which throughout the world now is the most used firearm. And it replaced all of their weapons. And now there's this new class that wasn't around before called an assault rifle. And it's a term that's been used a lot, but the military has a very, very strict definition of it, and there's a whole bunch of licensing now in place to control who can get one and how they can get one. The Army defined an assault rifle as a short, compact, selective fire weapon that is, uh, uh, that has a fire, I'm sorry, a short, compact, selective fire weapon that fires a cartridge of intermediate power. So it must, by definition, have selective fire, must fire an intermediate round, and it must have a detachable magazine, which is, uh, if any of you know anything about guns, you'll know that the one thing of that that is not common on any of today's weapons that any civilians have is selective fire. And that's because after, and that's because in 1986, there was a, uh, another bill that was passed called the, Fire, the Firearm Owners Protection Act, which put a ban on all new machine guns. And in order for a weapon to have selective fire, it would make, basically make it a machine gun, so no one could have them anymore. And it made the price of actual assault rifles sh shoot up. I, I looked on the internet this morning. It cost at least like 20 grand to buy a real assault rifle. Plus taxes and background checks and all that stuff. It's not something that people can easily get. And also I looked up how many there are because there wasn't, now that you can't buy new ones, there's only so many in circulation. There's about 180,000 assault rifles currently in circulation in the United States. So that's 300 million people about one assault rifle for every 1,500 people. So it's, there's, there's quite a few, but there's not as many as some people would believe. But because of this, of this incredibly restrictive definition, um, the media and government added a new class of weapons called assault weapons, which is basically any weapon that can be used in assault that is able to fire more than one round without having to be reloaded. There was, um, there was no actual legislation for that until 94, which is around the time where the first mass shootings really hit, hit the media. And then there was a whole bunch of things that were put in. The 1994 Federal Assault Weapons Ban, which tried to define it, defined it being as broad as saying any weapon that could have a foldable stock to a grenade launcher, just to be as inclusive as they could of everything so that people couldn't say, oh, that is or that isn't. They just tried to make it become all-inclusive, and that was expanded and continued. The most recent thing was in uh, July of last year, so just less than a year ago, um, the Background Checks for Responsible Person Acts, which is another thing to prevent people from being able to acquire firearms. And basically what that is is that now anyone, whether you're a person, a corporation, a trust, or anything else that is legally defined as a person, and 
I guess it's a whole different argument whether or not a corporation or a trust is considered a person. But now everything has to go through a background check. But amongst all these changes, there's been one political force that has put, a, put its foot out and said, I'm not gonna let all these changes happen so fast, and that is the NRA. The NRA, the National Armed Rifle Association, was formed back in 1871, and it was originally formed to promote shooting on a scientific basis. I'm not sure how much science they had about shooting in the 1870s, but that was why it was originally, it was originally founded. And it started off just to promote more accurate shooting, and then in the early 1900s, it started forming gun clubs and rifle clubs in schools to promote gun training and safety amongst children. And it expanded quite rapidly. In the 19 in 1990, it made a it finally made a move to move into politics, and it created its own foundation, the NRA Foundation, which is the thing that most of you know about now. The NRA Foundation, as some of you probably don't know, is a 501c3, so it's a nonprofit that's for education. Now, there are a lot of members of the NRA. It's everyone from small town pharmacists to commercial pilots. Um, everyone just hears about the gun makers funding it. But most of the revenue, which inclu uh, includes membership dues and stuff, doesn't come from large corporations. It comes from individual membership donations. In 2013, it raised record, it raised record donations of like $350 million in one year, mostly from individual con contributors. Because it's culturally acceptable to be a member and to donate. And most of the money that they take, with some exceptions, goes towards good causes. Now, um, the, to help the NRA recruit, recruit new members, it basically spreads pro-gun messages, but it also influences law and power. Now that's, that's where you hear about it in the media so much, is because of all the money that the NRA takes that goes towards law, political lobbying and things like that. Um, but it is a separate pool of money that it uses for political lobbying, and the money that individual members contribute doesn't actually go towards that, which is why there's a misconception of how much money they actually have and how much power they actually have, because of that huge amount of money that they receive, only a small fraction of it actually goes towards political lobbying. But because there are a few enough politicians that um, you don't need hundreds of millions of dollars to lobby them, which is sad that you can buy our politicians, but that's a different story. Um, In, after 2012, which was when the Sandy Hook shooting happened, it was the first time that the NRA Foundation really saw a true increase in donations. They, uh, after the Sandy Hook shooting happened, they put out a call trying to increase firearm education and they received $85 million in the span of just a couple months. Um, one of Clinton's sp spokesmen, uh, George Stephanopoulos, um, he said that he wants to. He wanted to make a vote for the NRA, despite the fact that he was in large against it. He said that the people who are members of the NRA are good citizens. They call their congressmen, they write, they vote, and they contribute, which is kind of amazing that someone would say that who is completely on the other side of the political spectrum. Now I'm going to go towards some st uh, study of gun safety. Um, there was a really comprehensive study of gun safety and effects of mass shootings and things um, called the Congressional Research, uh, by the Congressional Research Service, and it was the most comprehensive um, study of its, of its type that, uh, that I know about. That, I mean, if you look it up, you'll find it. Uh, I have a link to it, too. Um, but basically, uh, it says that mass shootings are rare in the United States, con considering how many other types of shootings there are. Ever, no one's going to doubt that mass shootings happen, but they don't happen as often considering the population and the land mass that people would think. Um, uh, it says uh, they definitely happen more often than they, according to the study, they happen more often than they used to. But there's not a solid trend of uh, the number of mass shootings causing an epidemic. It's definitely happening, and it's affecting a lot of lives, but it's not affecting lives to the point where like, an epidemic would say that you are in imminent danger. The study took place between 1999 and 2013, 
and it defined a mass shooting as a multiple homicide incident in which four or more victims are murdered by a firearm within one event in one or more locations or in close proximity. And because of the underlying circumstances of mass shootings vary incredibly and widely, the study categorizes um, crimes, whether they're family or felony, um, if they take place in a school, a restaurant, a church, etc. The study showed that 71% of mass shootings and 79% of all fatal victims over the entire 15 year period were family or, fel or felony related, while the vast majority of shootings covered by the news and media, which is only about one, which is 21% or one fifth of the incidents actually involved legally, or legally purchased firearms. Uh, Anti-gun groups and their allies uh, in the news media portray mass shootings as a common event that um, puts the public at extreme risk. But throughout the years of 1999 and 2013, when this study happened, um, it turns out that of all deaths in the United States, less than 0.004% of deaths were actually caused by mass shootings, and less than 1% of all deaths are murdered in general. Which means that um, less than one fifteenth the number of non firearm murder victims in the United States are caused by firearms. And the total resulting average was the odds of being killed by mass shooting are one in 517,000. So just under one and a half a million people will die from a mass shooting, which is bad, but it's not the epidemic that the media placed it to be. Okay, I guess that's it.